Welcome on Democracy with FP Wellman. I am, of course, your host, Fred Wellman. Uh, you know, it's been another difficult and challenging week in the United States, and usually it's politics. But on Monday, the nation was shocked once again by a shooting at an elementary school. Three nine-year-old kids and three adult staffers were murdered in cold blood. And once again, we're asking ourselves, when will enough be enough? And so I can't think of an issue that's impacting our national dialogue and, frankly, our democracy more than guns. So this week, I want to talk to one of the top leaders in the country on the topic, and so she's here. So let's not waste any time. Let's get on with the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. As I mentioned, I am Fred Wellman, the host of On Democracy with FP Wellman. You're in the right place at the right time. You know, it's um, it's hard for me to be my normally cheery self today after yet another shocking week in the United States of death. Um, slaughter of children, uh, and then, of course, the spin and deflection from our national political leaders, the shocking things and the shocking deflection from the facts that we face. You know, last season, we talked with Ryan Boosie, who is, uh, of course, from the industry, the gun industry. We had a great chat about gun industry's role in this and, and how those organizations play. But I really am very fortunate to be connected uh, to Chris Brown of the Brady Organization and uh, through both having worked with her. And of course, you know, you got to love military ties <laughs> as these things go. So I'm just thrilled to have someone who's really been in the fight. I don't think anybody's been in the fight much longer than you, Chris. So it's really wonderful to have you on the show. I want to introduce Chris Brown. Uh, her little bio, she's the president of Brady, one of the oldest and most respected anti-gun violence organizations in the United States. Named after legendary White House press secretary and gun violence advocates Jim and Sarah Brady, I believe. I think they're both included in the name, aren't they, Chris? They uh, are, yes. Chris has led Brady since 2016, longtime veteran of the gun violence prevention work, starting her career on Capitol Hill. Uh, advocate for the bill that would actually become the groundbreaking Brady Bill, requiring batter, uh, background checks on federally gun licensed gun sales. So I had the privilege to work with Brady uh, in my previous life as a veterans advocate. We, we worked on your efforts for encouraging safe storage and suicide prevention efforts in the veteran yeah. military community. So Chris, man, welcome to the show. I know you're, you've been on TV almost continuously uh, <laughs> and, 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 and carrying the water in this fight. So thank you for taking time for us on our little podcast uh, after a terrible week of violence on Monday. You know, it's, it's the 42nd anniversary of the day Jim Brady was shot. Uh, March 30th. Indeed it is. And I remember, and thanks so much, Fred. It was uh, great to work with you. Thank you for your voice. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, we need many more people uh, across America in red states and blue states, gun owners and non-gun owners. This is a uniquely American epidemic gun violence. It's the number one killer now of our children. Shut and up. I remember being uh, a child. I'll say that now as uh, <laughs> I was woman in high school. A age. <laughs> I, I was very young. I came home and uh, saw the news. And I remember feeling completely shocked about what happened. And honestly, I think it uh, was one of the moments in my life, other than the uh, Challenger explosion, yeah. where I really felt my sense of safety and security. And But I've been taught that our country is a certain way and we're the land of the free and the home of the brave being greatly disrupted. And it stayed that way for a long time for me. And I probably didn't ever fully go away. And I suspect a lot of Americans felt that way. I encounter so many people who will tell me, I remember exactly where I was yep. when I found out that President Reagan and Jim Brady were shot. And now the sad thing is this is an everyday occurrence, but it's not about national figures. Sometimes it is. It's about friends of friends or right. children right. Uh, or your own child. And that is why I'm motivated every day to make a difference. I view this as one of the most essential things that we need to fix to have an America worth inheriting for our children. And between my partner and I, we have four. Yeah. And that's very important to me. Yeah. I, I think you answered my first question. I always ask on the show is, you know, how did you get here? You started on Capitol Hill, I believe. You were, you were a lawyer at one point. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, guess, I still play one. I guess so, I guess so yeah. many former lawyers <laughs> uh, you know, on the show um, because I guess so many of our ab your advocates by nature. I mean, you ended up, how did you end up at Brady in 2016? What was your arc to this moment where you're on TV, you're fighting this good battle, you're on in the halls of Congress, you're, you're traveling the country fighting this battle? What was your arc to this moment? Uh, well, it's a long, it's a long answer to a short question, but just to make it succinct, I think ultimately the reason why is 
I feel very deeply I'm a, a quite a patriotic American, and I think gun violence is a scourge. It's a stain on our country that is uh, taking a toll that we can't even fully internalize. And part of that movement to me was working in the private sector for 16 years. I was a litigator at a major law firm. I moved overseas to be general counsel of a company. My family and I lived in Zurich, Switzerland. Mm. And every time I talked to a friend or colleague or friend of a friend who was thinking about traveling overseas to America, I got asked the same question, Mm. which is, where can I go that I can't be shot? And it was really a wake up call to me that, you know, we get these State Department advisories in the United States. You know, when you're going to travel, you think about what country should I not travel to? That's how the rest of the world thinks about our country. Wow. Supposedly the greatest country in the world, but not when gun violence is taking its toll. So I moved back to the U.S., I left the private sector, and I wanted to commit myself to make a change on this issue. And of course, I did know Jim and Sarah Brady. I joined Brady, and I couldn't be more proud of the work that we're doing or the activists all across this country who are spending their time um, for free, most of them making a difference. I wish fewer of them were survivors. Many of them are. Yeah. And I just feel often in America, most of us feel like we're one uh, social event or major public event away from being one of them. That's the problem. And it's taking a toll on all of our mental health. And I'll just say one more thing, Fred. Part of it, it was living in Switzerland with my girls. The issue that I felt was a sense of freedom and safety that I didn't know that I lacked, but I knew there And it's almost like a happiness quotient. We are denying ourselves a sense of freedom in this world, in this country that's unique to the American experience. And it takes a toll on every single one of us. Some of it is unacknowledged. Most of it is unacknowledged until we see these mass shootings. But the accumulation is every day. And we shouldn't live like this in a country that is supposedly one of the best on the planet. So that's why I'm called to work on this. Well, it's, it's a great calling. And as a mother, as I, I think I mentioned, we were in the pre-show, um, you know, I, I, I always talk to my girlfriend, Heather, about the show. And I say, hey, what should I ask? You know, because she's miles more smart than I am. <laughs> and, I, and today I said to her, and, and, and the visceral anger and the fear she has yeah. for our teenagers, right? We have teenage sons. And, and knowing that they're going to school, that visceral anger as a mother um, the, how do you protect your kids from something that's just, uh, no one seems interested in stopping, you know, you know, we're shocked again this week we had, but you know, after the shooting in Nashville, we, we've had some 130 mass shootings this year already. And we already saw a con- you know, Tennessee Congressman Tim Burchett out there saying, well, Congress really can't do anything. You know, I, I mean, he literally said we need to change people's hearts. Okay. Which is the most effing ridiculous thing. Right. And it's been widely mocked, but you said something really key on your, your, an NPR interview. I saw you said, this is that, that stance is a failure of democracy. And it just struck me. It's one of the reasons I started frantically calling you. <laughs> you know, Republicans <laughs> like to call this a constitutional republic, right? It's Which means we elect people to represent us and enact laws and governance that represents our needs and desires, right? What do most Americans want from their representatives? I, 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 I've heard numbers that are staggering, right? Americans want change, right, Chris? Yeah, they want change. And the reason I say it's a failure of democracy is, look, he and others like him They have talking points from the National Rifle Association that used to be a storied and wonderful organization. My dad was a life member. Formed by someone who uh, I think fought in the Civil War and wanted to make sure that safe storage and hunter's rights and marksmanship were a focus in the United States going forward. I've just completely uh, 30,000 foot level summarized it. The NRA really changed its its view of the world uh, when Wayne LaPierre took over. And the issue that I have is too many lawmakers who still feel beholden to what is now a failing organization, sadly. I don't say that with any relish, but it's just simply true. Uh, hold on to these talking points that the NRA put together 15, 20 years ago right. that say thoughts and prayers, it's too soon. 
Uh, I think this is something about mental health. I think it, it means we should pray more. And my issue with that is these people are elected to do one thing, to vote, right. to vote on bills. Right. And so the idea that there isn't a legislative solution would be like this, Fred. If in the 1950s, when cars were the number one killer of our children, now guns are, the manufacturers of automobiles went to Capitol Hill and said to all of the lawmakers, we don't want seatbelts, which by the way, they did do. And we don't want airbags and please no national speed limits and no bumper rails. And they said the lawmakers, how much money can you give me for my next campaign? And I will say that and I'll stop that from happening. We wouldn't have millions of Americans walking around today if that had been the paradigm. Instead, Congress and our nation said, let's do speed limits. Let's do bumper rails. Let's do airbags. Let's do seatbelts and have a national campaign around it. Why is the issue of firearms the only product in our country that we cannot handle and appropriately regulate in a way that is entirely consistent with the Second Amendment and its origin? Yep. We can, we must, and we should, or else the trajectory we, we are on will get worse and worse and worse. Yep. And, and I think you're right. And 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 it, I think the numbers are staggering. I think what 93% of Americans want expanded background checks. You've advocated for an expansion of the Brady Bill. Maybe, maybe some people aren't familiar with the Brady Bill and the aspects of it. Yeah. What, what is an expansion? Of the, so when you say to Congress, like, yeah, expand the damn Brady Bill, what, what does that look like, Chris? I mean, legislatively, yeah. what are we demanding yeah. from them when you say expand the Brady Bill? And it's related, Fred, if I could hearken back to your last question, to the failure of democracy point. Yeah. What I meant by failure of democracy is, the, the idea that our founders had around the House and to some extent the Senate, although the body was intended to be a little different, as we know, was it will represent the will of the people. Will right. People. Right. And here we have a topic or issue that across every demographic and most polls show a huge majority of Americans, in fact, a scant minority oppose. We have people across this country who want the change, and we have too many lawmakers elected who are standing in the way of that. When you have an issue, as we do, where 94% of Americans in the last poll want an expanded Brady background check system, for example, and Congress, the House, can't pass it, there is no better definition of a failure of democracy. Right. And when we think about the substance of it, which is answering now the, the question you actually asked, why is that important? Because all the Brady law really did, and by the way, that took still six years and seven votes, yep. and I worked with Jim and Sarah on this, and, and it was a, still super hard. A couple, a couple of presidents. <laughs> yeah, a couple of presidents. Uh, it says that the 1968 Gun Control Act that set up prohibited categories of purchasers of firearms. Folks, we all agree should not right. have easy access to firearms like convicted felons. Gun dealers in this country who are licensed by the ATF to be dealers, they should restrict sales to those individuals. This is not a controversial idea, no. right? The problem is in 1968, when that law was passed, there was no mechanized way for gun dealers to search the backgrounds of the individuals seeking to buy guns. So it was a law that existed on paper and there was no real way to enforce it. Okay. What the Brady law did is set up the National Instant Check System or NICS monitored by the FBI. The average gun dealer can now query a database of prohibited categories provided by the FBI, put through with state records as well that are relevant, and get an answer within seconds of whether or not someone is a prohibited purchaser. Right. That's what the Brady Law did. And I just want to say the National Rifle Association, stand, standing ostensibly in its origin for safe storage, fought Jim and Sarah every step of the way. But when that law finally passed, it fast passed with unanimous consent of the United States Senate. What that means is not a single Republican voted against it. So that also gives me hope yeah. that we can 
continue trying to make progress here. Yeah. yeah. Our history shows us we can. And what would expanding that today? Because I, I I think we've talked about, you know, there's there's loopholes now, right? The, there's the, there's yeah. the gun show loopholes. Yeah. Is that what we're looking to do is close those loopholes so that that. No, it's pretty simple. Like, yeah. actually, I've talked to my team and. I think the bill is like 30 pages long, but it could be five pages long. (laughs) And it really is just these two things, Fred, Uh, which, which really relate to the fact that the Brady law was passed in 93, signed into law in 94. Let's go back in time if we can. And the way, way back. Um, I remember it well, right. At that time, it, it's hard because we talked to our kids about this. There wasn't this thing we call the internet, right? <laughs> Dial up AOL. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, today, it's a little bit different. Yes. And so, and gun shows, which were small, not all over the country as they are now, yeah. were very small business. Both of those uh, avenues to purchase guns and to sell guns, even as private sellers, have taken off. So uh, the Brady law regulates background checks for federally licensed firearms dealers, but you could be a private seller and sell over the internet. And there are sites where this happens every day or at gun shows and not be technically required under the federal law to do background checks. Half of the states in America have said that's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, Yeah, that we can't allow people who are felons to easily access guns. So we're going to require even private sellers right. to do background checks on the Internet and on uh, uh, at gun shows. But here's why this is a problem. A patchwork of laws in a state in states that are largely contiguous means You could be in a state like Illinois that requires background checks for those kinds of sales. And what you do is you do a purchase online. You go to a state like Indiana that has not expanded the Brady law. You get your firearm assault style weapon. You come back to Illinois. And why do I use that example? Because we've represented victims of domestic violence who were shot by their abusers at their workplace with guns obtained in exactly this loophole. So it infuriates me that a few members of Congress, because of the National Rifle Association, have failed to do this because they continue to oppose this based on lies that this would somehow infringe people's Second Amendment rights. I don't think anyone in America today wants uh, an interpretation of the Second Amendment that's a death sentence to our fellow Americans. I agree. That's not what we want. And what drive, I mean, I, 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 is it money? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it just seems like I think it goes back to money eventually, right? <laughs> I mean, is that what's really, I mean, is that the truth? I mean, they say, oh, my Second Amendment rights, but usually I find out it's, and I like the NRA because they are somewhat fading in some ways, but is it the power? Yeah. I, think, I think Ryan, Ryan, I mentioned Ryan at the top of the, the show, Ryan Boosie, you know, the industry itself has, I mean, the industry is very different than, you know, it, from my life when I was a young man and, and my father was a gun owner, my father was a former Marine. He was a life member of the NRA. He quit, by the way. When they turned into a yeah. take my gun or my dead body, he actually gave it. He turned he turned in his life membership because he was disgusted about what like he saw. Like George Bush, right? Like yeah, and so yeah. so the, the and I'm a soldier, you know, I'm a, I'm a retired soldier. Yeah, so you are. so I think I think so the, the industry is different though now. Now everybody's making these guns. I mean, uh, I, I won't mention them, but a musician I used to be friends with has his own gun company in Tennessee now, making AR style weapons. You know, it seems like everybody's making them now. Is it is it that what's really driving this in the end? Is the money and the proliferation of these weapons, the money associated with these weapons? I mean. Is that the background? Yeah, of it is. My friend, Fred, my friend, Fred Guttenberg, who lost his daughter, Jamie, yeah. um, at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas high school shooting, has a book coming out called American Carnage. And uh, I'm sure he'd love to come on your show and talk about yeah, this. I know, but Fred. Basically, at the end of the day, if you look at what the gun industry has done over time, and this is really about the gun industry, this is not about gun owners. And I want to be really, really clear about that. This is not uh, something where Brady, as an organization, right, founded by Jim and Sarah, who were gun owners and continued to own guns after the shooting, and they were Republicans. This is not an issue where gun owners versus non-gun owners have to be or should be pitted against each other. We have let the gun industry to some extent 
dictate the terms of this. And we should not, because part of the reason we are where we are is in the 70s and 80s when gun sales overall were waning in this country. We know that the gun industry got together and said, gee, we have a problem. If we're not careful, our market share could erode by like 50% or more. What do we do about this? And that's why they started combating every means to regulate guns, not because it actually is it actually is an infringement on Second Amendment rights in any respect. Our right. origin on the Second Amendment I can get into in a separate question with you, Fred. Yeah. But it's just simply not. These kinds of things that we're talking about in terms of regulation, the colonial era had that all the way through. Right. You could have random inspections of colonial homes for how folks were storing their muskets. <laughs> I mean, this is as old as time, right? right. But the issue is profits. And so if you're in an industry with waning profits, what do you do as a mechanism to boost that? Well, you do a few things. And if you're lucky, and they've been very lucky, you do them really well. One, you remove all barriers to trade. So you reduce any obligation for a background check, because that's a barrier to trade. So Think about it that way. If you're in the industry, I was in the private sector for 16 years. I understand how this works. Number two, you limit uh, folks' ability to bring a lawsuit against you. Well, they got the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act through, which stops anyone from being able to sue. Number three, you make this an issue about quote unquote values. And so if you look back on it and the Sandy Hook case really they bear this, what they're trying to sell here is toxic masculinity. That's right. why they've marketed get right. your man card here right. with sales of ARs. And that's the trifecta. And unfortunately, they've been successful about it. I think it's important for folks to know when I get asked questions, why can't you talk to the NRA more? I have reached out to Wayne LaPierre repeatedly. He has never agreed to meet with me. He's 10 down, miles down the road. Right. Right. Neighbors. Um, I want to do that. I think that would be great. It would be a wonderful step for our democracy. They're completely uninter- in, uninterested because they're not representing average gun owners. They're representing the gun industry. And let's be super clear about that. It's, it's right there. You know, it, you talk about the gun owner part of it. You know, four years ago, myself and four of my fellow veterans, uh, Travis Akers and David Shah and David Jamali, um, Chris Beck, we, we, we got together and wrote an op-ed for Newsweek. I mean, it's been four years. So great. Right? right? And and we said, you yeah. know, we said one of the biggest points that we made was that gun dealers have a duty to report suspicious activity. Like this responsible gun owner, it's always weird here. Well, you're going to hurt responsible gun owners, right? And we were saying, look, all of us are responsible gun owners. I have a weapon. I have a, I have a handgun that I purchased because of reasons. <laughs> you know, I was raised as a, I was a soldier. I was raised by a Marine. We used to shoot in a quarry, right? The quarry I used to shoot at with my dad is probably five miles from here. Right. And, and that's what you did back in the seventies. You just go out and court and shoot. And, but my weapon is at home. The ammunition separate. It's in a fingerprint locked gun safe <laughs> that is secured to the wall. Right. And so this is just basic stuff. And we were saying what we demand, what we said is like, look, if, if we keep hearing about responsible gun owners, but with a responsible gun owner role in this is to support background checks. It's for gun dealers to say, you know what? This looks suspicious. I mean, look at Nashville. She purchased seven firearms water the care of a physician so you know i guess how can we change the attitudes amongst gun owners and supporters and that change is possible without the second amendment stuff is do we how do we break the, the 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 cycle between these two groups does that make sense oh it makes a lot of sense um brady has been trying to think about that for a long time because one of the ways to do it is not to be uh divisive and not to uh, say that the desire to own a gun is a problem. Right. And, and too often, I think those in the gun violence prevention movement have done that. Obviously, you know, Bruce, my partner very well. And, uh, he's good. He and for, he's all right for this. a Navy guy, but it's fine. I know. He's all right for <laughs> I know how you feel about each other. Uh, but, uh, and you've transcended those boundaries yeah, of somehow. Navy versus Marines versus Air Force. But, 
at the end of the day, I do think that the conversations I've had with him have been about as instructive as I've had with anyone because of what he's told me the military does in terms of training around firearms. So he was a, a, a fighter pilot for many, many years. He had some missions that were a lot harder than others, but he flew over Mogadishu and he told me about the discussions in the ready command center about carrying firearms. And for a long time, they did not have the fighter pilots carry any weapon Mm -hmm. because they thought the risk to the pilot did not uh, equate with the reward of their, them potentially uh, protecting themselves. Um, at, At some point that, that decision changed. We can all look back in history for a flight operation. And what Bruce told me is they would check the weapon out with the officer and then it would be checked back in and they had an entire drill and safety every time with every flight about how to use that weapon. And the point is the military understands. Yes. And that's why so many veterans like you are so important to this, to lift their voice, to answer the question, Fred, is we have to. We uh, we have to amplify and we have to socialize the idea that safe gun storage and that responsible gun ownership is the essence of freedom in this country, if that's what we want. And we need many more veterans across this country to join us at Brady in that message, because there is no better messenger for this at all in yeah. this entire country than people like you well, thank and you. others like you. Well, that's what we say. I mean, you don't just get handed a weapon in the military, right? For you, 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 First, you get a background check, ironically. <laughs> you don't get a clearance without a background check. You can't even go in without a background check. Oh, that's weird. You actually get a background check? Well, yeah, you get a background check. Then you get training uh, with a yeah. with a, a, an unloaded weapon. You train with an unloaded weapon. You saw that weapon stored in a secure room with double locks and an alarm, uh, uh, ammunition stored separately. Well, you know, you get that. You go to a range under the tutelage of a, a senior who te- teaches you proper usage. By the way, if you don't teach the weapon properly, if you have a misfire or something like that, there's punishment. There's actually a uniform code Amazing. of military jet, right? You, you're punished yeah. for mishandling a weapon. There's actually a price you pay if you do it. When you're done using the weapon, the weapon goes back in the arms room. Ammunition is safe. It's, it's cleared safety. If you are stupid enough to fire the weapon as you're clearing it, there's a punishment for that. Men have, men and women have lost their careers for shooting a weapon improperly. So so it, the idea there's this, I love that you talk about the toxic masculinity guys these guys are always coming at me oh what do you know about being a soldier oh, a goddamn ranger for fuck's sake <laughs> you know I, I know plenty about carrying weapons thank you very much you know you know and you know and and again nobody nobody foolish enough to hand me a weapon i used to tease my son was a soldier i was like god they're gonna give you a gun that freaks me out <laughs> you know but he ended up being an mp ended up being a sniper in the mps for god's sake but you know uh, one thing and circling back to the democracy part of this right so one thing that former one of our former guests and, and two-time guests uh Greg Sargent, the columnist from the Washington Post, has been highlighting recently is how Democratic-led states can enact laws. To, you know, there's been a movement, and, and we, I, I guess I'm putting the cart for the horse. We can talk about the bad side of this, but I kind of want to start the good side of this, which there's a movement in a lot of our, our Democratic-led states lately to kind of push back on this rise of extremism and the, and the, and the right march. I live in Missouri, um, you know, like in Michigan, where they, uh, you know, they, they rolled back right to work. and try. Are you seeing some states enacting laws that are having an impact? Like, like let's point to an example of where things are working, right? I know Massachusetts. Massachusetts is very low gun for it. So before we get into the, the messed up ones, hi, I'm in Missouri, uh, <laughs> where they actually tried to outlaw yeah, cooperating with the federal government. Talk you know. a lot but about it, Missouri. Oh, geez, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, um, but let's circle. I'd like to start with the positive one. What states are doing it right? And what, did that look, what does right look like in some of those states? And what's the impact of that? Well, more gun violence prevention laws are better. Yeah, and there you go, right? What the data shows at a minimum is states that have done two things if they have robust permitting systems Mm -hmm. and they have expanded the Brady background check. So those loopholes holes I talked about, about private sellers being able to sell guns on the internet or gun shows, they've stopped that. So you have to have background checks before, regardless of who you are, before you can sell a firearm. What Daniel Webster at Johns Hopkins has found is looking at all of the States in the United States, those two things alone mean you will have appreciably less gun death and less gun injury than those states that don't have 
those laws. What we also know is more is better. And so look at a state like California, which I hold up and I understand California has become and the world we live today political, but I only hold it up in this sense. They have passed a large number of gun violence prevention laws. And I want to give a shout out to my friend and mentor, Amanda Wilcox, who lost her daughter, Laura, uh, to gun violence more than 20 years ago and became a huge advocate around this. And she has single-handedly helped pass these laws in the state of California. She's an American hero. And in doing so, she has created a system in California that means per capita, California has the lowest rate of gun death and injury, one of the top five lowest in the entire United States of America. Wow. So the, the bottom line is gun laws work and more and better gun laws work to reduce gun death and injury. There are people alive in these states today who would not be if these laws did not exist. And not a single one of them so far has been held as unconstitutional, except in the Bruin case, which is uh, out of left field. That's the most uh, recent Supreme Court decision that upended uh, New York's concealed carry system. Right. Wow. That's that's good. So on the flip side, you've got states, you know, r- rolling back what few restrictions exist. Right. I mean, I, I, I think you mentioned even this week. I mean, this ridiculous constitutional carry movement or God, the open carry movement makes me insane because a lot of the open carry movement came from a fellow veteran that I actually know, by the way, from Texas. You know, Florida's moving forward just this week. You know, I live in Missouri where they passed the absolutely insane I have to read Second Amendment Preservation Act that banned law enforcement from actually cooperating with or enforcing federal gun laws, which, by the way, was found unconstitutional. Interestingly, just in May. So on one hand, you're saying they're saying they can't do anything to stop gun violence, but they're aggressively making it easier to increase that violence. Um, What are some of the most egregious examples you're seeing of those? I mean, something like, again, in in these constitutional carry, and it it just seems like they're just hell bent on making it um, more deadly. Well, I'll, I'll name two, and it's from my 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 state with my favorite governor, uh, Ron DeSantis, ah, yes. to, to use as an example. But two, one mm-hmm. historic and one new. Uh, so, uh, the NRA propagated a a law that passed the Florida legislature that precluded uh, physicians from talking to their patients about the issue of guns, not in any political way, but just, do you have a gun in the home? Are you safely storing it? It was a gag order. Uh, And Brady uh, successfully represented a class of physicians against the NRA in that lawsuit and won uh, through the 11th circuit. And so we held, that was held unconstitutional. So that's one just egregious and it's ironic, right? That basically they were pushing a version of the second amendment that's so extreme that it trampled on the first First amendment. Amendment, That's what we see over and over and over again. Consistently. Sorry, Fred, you, you, Say, yeah, consistently they're stepping on the First Amendment to say the Second Amendment, which is, I can't imagine a scenario where that's where our founding fathers had in mind. And not even theoretically, but but also for us. And so the second example of this is with respect to Florida overturning its permitting system that even gun owners say, it's fine, it works well. It just makes sure that I have some training before I'm going to carry a concealed gun into public domain. And so Florida is seeking to overturn that system, not because of any substance, not because anyone has complained it doesn't work. It actually works really well. And we have data to show that it's helped deny permits to folks who all of us agree should not have guns, who wouldn't even pass a Brady background check. Right. This is about Uh, Ron DeSantis being able to message that he's a Second Amendment advocate, but his version of it is a death sentence to all of the rest of us. Even in the Wild West, when you would go into these border or frontier towns, you know, most of the time the regulations were you had to check your gun at the border. Mm. From the very origin of our country, it has been understood that guns in public could be a danger. And so the reason I say that's related to the gag order is 
Fred, I speak in public all of the time. And in some states that have open carry, my team will have to get security for me, right? Because I could be standing next to someone who has a loaded AR and they're allowed to do that. And let me just tell you one more piece of this absurdity. Tennessee has some of, uh, aside from Florida and your state of Missouri, I might say, uh, some of the most uh, uh, backward gun laws in the country, right? They just repealed their permitting system in the state. And so a lot of folks are questioning whether or not if the police had even seen the shooter with a loaded AR going into that school, they could have legally arrested that person. And I think the answer is probably... It's really hard to tell right. if the school had a policy to restrict them. How are police supposed to know in any given building? Do they allow guns or not? I mean, this is cuckoo where the rights of the gun supersede the rights of our children not to be shot at school. That's not an America that any of us want to live in. That's what they are conscripting us to. Yeah. And I hope that folks listening understand those are the stakes, actually. You know, one of the thing, uh, programs I love that you do, you know, away from mass shootings, is the the, the, de- the, the deadly nature of, of accidental death and, uh, you know, unsecured weapons. I love your end family fire program. I Full disclosure, I helped, I helped support it when I was working. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, full disclosure, I was a, I was a paid consultant. But, <laughs> but no, I love it. And, and we found, and I was attracted to it and still am, because we we've, there's study after study that shows in veterans, you know, obviously the scourge of the veterans communities are suicide rate. Um, everyone yeah. knows this. Um, but study after study has shown that a well secured weapon separate from ammo with uh, you know a barrier to ease that the suicide ideation, suicide ideation is a 30 second decision right and so anything that delays the suicide ideation through having to find the weapon find the key on secure but de- often mm-hmm. sidetracks a, a, a sidetracks a, um, a, a suicide you actually gave a speech that I watched online where you talked about the and family fire program and how you'd gotten a letter from a mom whose son was at counseling and had actually sought out their family gun and the mom had seen your PSAs and secured the weapon in a safe so that her child was not able to get easy access to the gun tell me more about these statistics and why it's so important the safe storage if you got a gun great you're allowed to have a damn gun but shouldn't that gun be locked up safely and, and what that means Thanks so much for the question, Fred. Yeah, among the things that we work on, I'm frankly most proud of this because so often I hear from people, look, I don't have the time necessarily to raise my voice and I can't travel to our state capitol. I want to help you with enforcement, but that would require me meeting with local police. What else can I do? And this is the what else can I do? And Family Fire is a campaign to help average everyday individuals, especially gun owners, think about safe storage in their own homes and also talk about it with others for gun owners and non-gun owners. And that has been a campaign that's like our version of designated driver, secondhand smoke or safety belts. Family fire is the injury or death of a loved one in a home with a loaded and unsecured gun. For kids, nine kids a day are killed or injured with a gun in the home. If you have a loaded and unsecured gun in the home, you have a three times increased rate of suicide and 75% of school shooters get their gun from an unsecured location in a home, meaning it's not safely stored. So if we think about those three areas, and I think about what is leading to 100 people a day dying from gun violence, we would save about 70 lives a day through safe storage. Let's just think about that. That's more important than any law Congress can pass, than any enforcement. And that's why I'm so focused on this is it's on us, all of us. If we own guns, that means safely storing the gun, just like you talked about from your time in the Rangers and being trained. That's the history and legacy of how our military are trained. Why should we as civilians treat our firearms any differently? Because we're bringing them in with the idea that this action can save our family. But what if that action actually harms your family? Imagine being the person who has to live with that. And believe me, Fred, 
I know far too many, and I don't want that to happen to the next person. So for those who want more information about this, and it's not just an ad campaign, there are all kinds of things that folks can do to train first responders and others so that we can actually talk about this risk in a way that transcends political boundaries. It brings people together, families together, neighborhoods together. Go to endfamilyfire.org or Brady United's website to find out more information. I love it. And I try to end, I really appreciate it. And I really mm-hmm. encourage our listeners and viewers to go do that because it's just a, such a simple thing. A trigger lock, there's a million ways you can do it, but you just got to do it properly. What I love is uh, my son visited someone, um, um, I know, and uh they were traveling across country. His girlfriend. They stopped this person's house, and the person would give them a tour of their house. And they showed them their closet, and their closet was full of guns. Their their collection, mm-hmm. many of them historical. And my son snuck away and texted me. Goes, "Oh my freaking god, dad!" <laughs> yeah, and he's he was at eighteen or nineteen at the time. He goes, "You're not gonna believe this. They have all their guns just in the closet, unsecured." Isn't this insane? It's like, and I just love it. And that brings me to the last point. As I try to always, you know, viewers and listeners know, I try to actually be hopeful in spite of this, all these things. I, I'm ridiculously an optimist at this point. I don't know why. But, you know, before the show, my friend and previous guest, John De La Volpe, whose book is here, uh, posted a new Harvard Institute of Politics youth poll. He runs polling there at yeah. Harvard. Uh, yeah. a special release field just for, you probably saw this. A special yeah. release poll field just before the Nashville shooting shows that 65% of youth support stricter gun laws. And this cuts across urban and small town divides. Uh-huh. In addition... 73% support psychological exams for gun purchases, including 88%, 88% of identified Democrats and 59% of Republican youth in this poll. That's an increase across the board of remarkable 14% since the spring of 2013. I mean, it sounds like the next generation who's grown up, you know, with Parkland has grown up since Sandy Hook. They, they understand the stakes. Does, does that give you hope? I mean, I, I joke on here a lot because I do focus on, on Gen Z and the youth youth issues, but does it give you hope that the youth get it, that, that the youth will save us at some point, Chris? I mean, uh, should we find hope yeah, that the next generation gets it? I would just it? put a fine point on that, Fred, it, which is I've heard that from a lot of people. And yes, uh, the youth are very focused on this. My, my supposition, I've talked to some social scientists, including those at Harvard, looking at this. I think part of that is this is generation lockdown. Right. So they were trained on run, hide, fight. And, you know, our kids are smart. They understand uh, that's not really saving me. And I think that I want to believe in Santa Claus and the uh, tooth fairy. And you've just told me with this, uh, I can't believe anything you say. And it's a tragedy uh, in a lot of different dimensions. And so I think, yes, this generation, and they've proven it to us from 2018 because they're voting on this issue and four candidates in record number who care. And I would just say folks on the other side of the ledger, more of them need to be like Brian Fitzpatrick, a Republican in the House, who understands that and gets that. I'm not sure everyone in the Republican Party has gotten the memo. I think they will. I hope they do, because this should not be an issue that divides the parties. But it's not the youth that are going to save us here. As a Gen Xer myself, what I would say is it takes all of us. All of us have to raise our voices. And for those of us in generations senior to that, we have to get more of our peers to do something because it can't just be them. We'll, we'll, it will take another five, 10 years than it should. And we're conscripting our kids and our grandkids to an America in which a lot of people are trying to flee it. They are leaving this country for safer spaces. That's insane. It's yep. terrible, but that's the reality. Yep. And so it's on all of us, not just them, but they are definitely the tip of the spear. Well, wonderful. Chris, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time with us. You're so generous of your time, and now you're very busy. Um, I always ask guests, where can we, you, you mentioned nfamilyfire.org. Where can we find you online, on Twitter, wherever you hang out? Um, obviously, you're on TV a lot, and I love that. So where can we find you online? Uh, so you can find me on Twitter. I always forget my handle. It's a little bit complicated. Hopefully, you can follow up with folks on that. Uh, <laughs> On, uh, you can find me at bradyunited.org. Uh, please go to nfamilyfire.org as well to get more information about our cause. On Insta, you'll find me. Um, wherever there is access to information, that's where we are. 
I love it. Well, Chris, thanks for your time today, and, and good luck in the fight. If you let me know if I can help in any way, and I think average Americans are kind of getting sick of it. So I'm, I'm encouraged by some of the stuff we've talked about already, and, and I hope that our colleagues in the Congress finally wake up to this reality. So thank you for your time. You too. Have a great day. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks so much, Fred. Fight. Thanks for your service. Thanks for everything you've done. Thank you. Great talk. <laughs> um, you know, not my usual cheery self, but this is such an important topic, right? Uh, we are facing a scourge. Um, the fact that the number one killer of our kids from the age of one to 19 is now firearms should put a cold chill through any American. It should absolutely serve as a dire warning to our leaders in Congress and in Washington, D.C. The fact they continue to refuse to address this scourge, they continue to fight back. My God, yesterday we were mocking Lauren freaking Boebert because she spent five minutes in a congressional hearing grilling a guy from the D.C. City Council about their effort to possibly repeal public urination as a crime. Public fucking urination was what our elected representatives prioritized over our children's lives. So at some point, y'all need to be pissed off. At some point, we need to be angry for our kids. At some point, we hold these people accountable and they don't waste our goddamn time grilling city officials about public urination laws when our kids are being fucking murdered. So, a little bit more of a serious show this week. We'll get back to some fun stuff next week, perhaps. But our democracy faces a moment. The show is on democracy with F.P. Wellman. It's on democracy. Our democracy is at stake when it's awash with guns and the violence isn't slowing down. So, with that, thanks as always for joining the show. You can find me at, at F.P. Wellman on Twitter, or at least for now. I'm verified till next week, apparently. I will not be buying an $8 blue check mark. You can suck it. <laughs> I am on FP Wellman official on Instagram. The show is on Democracy Pod on Twitter. Not not verified. You can always find us there. Uh, of course, our YouTube channel, Auto Democracy Podcast. I really wish you'd love you to, to follow that, subscribe to that. As I mentioned, I'm going to be launching a Substack. I fuck, would love for you guys to subscribe to that. I intend to build a larger community around the show, so you'll get some of the clips, you'll get the show, you'll get you'll get discussions with more people. You'll see some of my writing and my griping, and maybe even some of my history. A great week ahead, I hope, for you and me and all of us in the nation. I hope you get a relaxing weekend. With all that, as always, please like, subscribe, share, all the things, review, a positive review would be lovely. Uh, the show, keep on joining us. Keep up the fight for our democracy. I'll see you and talk to you next week.